well. Um, very powerful emotional experience watching that film, and I was wondering what inspired you to do it. Uh, how did yeah. you find out about Aaron, and, and why did you make the film? Yeah, so I was, uh, my, my previous film was about hackers, it's called uh, We Are Legion, Story of the Hacktivists. And uh, I was on a panel uh, in New York with Quinn Norton about a week after Aaron died. And um, there was uh, a lot of people, everybody at this kind of event we were at seemed to know Aaron and have a story about Aaron. So I, I just started filming right away mm -hmm. and asking people about it. This was at the very beginning of this kind of uh, wave of anger and frustration and sympathy that was coming out of the internet, sort of welling up from the internet. And so I wanted to understand that, why so many people responded to his story. Um, but, but also, um, I just found his story really compelling and on a personal level. And, um, uh, and a way to get off, get, start talking about some of these bigger issues that I think are really, really important uh, for, our, for our time. You know? um, a conversation with Aaron's dad was really moving to me. Yeah, yeah. Because um, uh, I, the first time I ever talked to Aaron's dad, Robert, I was, it was about an hour and a half conversation. And I had just actually lost a friend myself to suicide about four months before that. Yeah. And I had be I'd become a new father myself. Yes. And so. Um, Th that is your son in the that back. That actually yes. was him, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ex expressing uh, approval of your yeah. comments, yes. But um, it's it just a very mo moving to me. He yeah. just lost a son, I'd lost a friend, I'd yeah. become a new father. It sort of shifts your, person your perspective yeah. a little. And so yeah. I just I, I felt like I really needed to tell the story, both for the personal reason and, and uh, because the, what he was into was so relevant, I thought, for, yeah. for this moment. Yeah, the access to everybody in the story, except for the prosecution, yeah, interestingly, yeah. Uh, was really quite amazing. Um, let me just turn to, to Larry. Watching the film, you, you ask yourself uh, kind of, what a wa you, you say, what a waste, and you ask yourself, what, what is Aaron's legacy? I mean, what, what do we learn uh, from his life and from his death, and what did you learn? So, uh, you know, there's so few people who strike you as singularly focused on trying to make the world a better place according to their conception of it. And he was very lucky because he could afford to do that because he basically tripped into success with the Reddit um, yeah. uh, company. So he, he secured money so that he could live very frugally, but he basically... Mm -hmm. Imagine living the rest of his life just trying to make things better. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's such a stunningly rare characteristic, yeah. character. Um, and, and that's who he was. And now, you know, I think the challenge afterwards is how do we take that and, and do something with that? I mean, this film is an incredible contribution, but there's more to be done with that, I think. Yeah. I mean, and the film sort of suggests uh, almost a generation gap between kind of the young tech savvy people who are trying to do things differently and a kind of clueless, and the word clueless was used, a, a clueless um, establishment, and it's almost a 60s word, that uh, doesn't understand the internet and is more profit oriented than they are, um, kind of uh, oriented towards doing good. Um, do you accept that there is that generation gap? Um, and um, you know, is it really only young people who, who have this, uh, this desire? I guess my sense is it's not a generation gap as much as um, an ignorance gap. You uh -huh. know, um, uh -huh. there are plenty of people who are 40 and 50, who, uh, 60, who completely understand what's going on here and are as in tune with it as Aaron was. But people who don't have this technical sense or the awareness, right. you know, it's a, it's a source of great fear. And, mm. and in some sense, you know, it felt like the prosecution was acting on this great fear. Like, you know, the kind of crudeness of not being able to distinguish between somebody stealing social security numbers from the, yeah. from the government and somebody downloading articles from JSTOR, you know, is appropriate in a world where people just don't understand what's going on here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and and the refusal to understand over time and to adjust over time in light of what they came to understand showed a kind of uh, you know, thickness and callousness to, to, the, to, you know, to what was going, to what was truly the story. Yeah. And, and you had mentioned, and I'll come back to you, Brian, in a mm -hmm. second, you, you had mentioned that Aaron had kind of helped steer you towards what is really 
and a major passion of yours now, which is uh, trying to do something about the power of big money and politics. And you've started a super PAC to fight super PACs, essentially. Um, how did Aaron influence you on that? And, uh, and how is that going, by the way? Yeah, so, you know, he influenced me the way he influenced everybody. He, he, um, he sort of held, my, he held me up to myself. Hmm. You know, he basically, here's who you think you want to be. Well, here's what that would mean. Um, and so he said to me, you know, you're working on these intellect, internet uh, and intellectual property questions. Why do you think you're going to make any progress on that? As long as there's this corruption in the way the system works. And I resisted sort of taking this on because I, you know, what did I know about this? I didn't want to have to learn a whole new field. And, um, but he held me to it. And that eventually brought me to the point that I realized I had to accept the challenge. Um, and I could afford to accept the challenge, not because I'm rich, but because I'm protected. I'm like a very fortunate creature in, you know, in an ecosystem that doesn't punish you for changing your mind or saying what you believe. You know, and it's rare in our society for those people, right? I mean, if you're wealthy, you can do it. But if you're a lawyer, you can't do it. If you work for the government, you can't do it. If you work for a news agency, you can't do it. You know, that's what we professors, we get to do. And, that's, mm -hmm. and he basically kind of held that up. This is your freedom. What are you going to do with your freedom? Mm -hmm. um, so he started me. And he, uh, he was with me in the beginning. We started an organization called Change Congress. Um, he was the CTO. He invented all sorts of incredible technology that helped us build. And, mm. um, and then he got wooed by Obama. Uh, you know, he kind of imagined this great progressive president. It was a great chance to do all these progressive things. And he started Demand Progress yeah. after he was working with uh, PCCC. Um, uh, and I always teased him that, you know, he was more interested in list building and girls. And he had left me to the... Uh, mm. Um, to the hard work of the corruption fight, um, but that he would come back someday. Um, and he's not coming back. Yeah, yeah. So, so Brian, uh, well, maybe I can just yeah, go ahead. blatantly promote in, in, Larry, ahead. in Larry's honor that the May Day campaign is, is in its home stretches here. It needs, uh, it needs all the help it can get. It's a fantastic effort. And uh, I've donated, and lots of people have donated and stand up, and, and we've got three or four more days yeah. yeah. So, so there must be a website on which you go to find out yeah. about it. Mayday, so what, what is that website? Mayday.us. Mayday.us. Right. Okay. Um, or come to me and say, here's what I pledge. <laughs> That's <laughs> even easier. Yeah. Okay. Um, Brian, watching the film, and this is the second time I've seen it, um, you know, you, you kind of have your finger on the scales. So, uh, you know, it, it seems to reflect the political point of view that, that you have, that uh, the justice system is skewed against um, the little guy and, and typically poor people and, and minorities. Uh, it, it seems as if you m must feel as if you're part of the open access movement. At least that's the sense I got from the film, that is that you, you bring a lot of your own um, viewpoint behind it. Am I correct in that? And do you consider yourself part of the open access uh, movement? N no. Or no, just, not so it's such an effective documentarian that I came away <laughs> feeling that <laughs> yeah. way. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I'm certainly he, he, a lot of the things that Aaron was fighting for. I, I certainly I, I was I, I was sort of already there with him. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's probably evident from other stuff I've done. But um, I mean, I, I think um, you know, I, I wouldn't say I, I would I would hope I've got to step backwards and not say that I'm you know part you know part of it, but I'm. Kind of analyzing and, and giving a voice to it, and trying to have show, you know, uh, empathize with it to the extent that it can be, yeah. you, know, you know, explained. Um, but um, I thought you were going to say that the fingers on, uh, with, in terms of the prosecutor. Uh, well, certainly you know, that as well. I mean, it, 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 there's a very dismal picture of the criminal justice system, yeah. and I guess I was asking myself, was this a perfect storm of a very ambitious individual prosecutor, a lack of understanding of the internet, and just sort of a coming together of particular circumstances, or is this really emblematic, as the, I think the film implies, of how the criminal justice system works more broadly. I think it's all of those things, probably, which uh -huh. is which is bad news. Uh -huh. uh, you know, so yeah, I think it's I think it's all of those things. I think it's yeah. a misunderstanding of our uh, computer laws, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. No meaningful changes since 1986. It's mm -hmm. still a law that's 
that really governs a lot of these crimes. Um, and I think, I think we all know we've, our lives have changed in terms of these massively networked ways that we communicate now quite a bit since 1986. Yeah. So why is this still the primary law with, with no changes? Um, and, then, and then, yeah, the, the criminal justice system is broken. I mean, uh, we've given prosecutors lots of power to, to kind of leverage against defendants. I mean, they want to break defendants. That's their point. Uh, and because of that, 97% of the cases in our criminal justice system plead out. They don't, only 3% go to trial. Uh, it can't be that 97% of the cases in our criminal justice system, people are guilty. So this has led to mass incarceration in uh, this country, you know, 2.3 million people in jails and prisons, another 5 million in the control of the criminal justice system, probation and parole. Uh, that gives us the highest rate of incarceration in the world, by far. Uh, second and third, or a distant second and third, and they're countries in which we routinely yeah. criticize their human rights records. Right. So, but isn't um, our crime rate so low because we incarcerate so many people? That's well, <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, no, I think we're going to look back at this and be and, and really wonder why we lock up so many of our own citizens, and and there's there's problems here. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I was interested in pursuing a little bit, uh, you don't seem to place a lot of value on the people who actually organize information as, as opposed, or, or at least this movement, and uh, people who organize information as opposed to the people um, who create it. And you could argue that um, more information is available to more people now because of the JSTORs and Google and, mm -hmm. and other people who basically take this vast amount of information and organize it in a way that uh, more people can get access to it. And it doesn't that have some economic value that um, can be rewarded by paying the people who do it? Yes, um, it does. Uh, I'm curious to hear what Larry says, but, yeah. but the, you know, something like JSTOR was very useful in the yeah. beginning, right? In the 90s, um, they were taking these old documents and scanning them and putting them online, yeah. and suddenly things that were just buried away somewhere in a, in a yeah. library are now accessible. This, there is obviously right. value to that, and yeah. there's obviously cost to that. Yeah. But uh, technology has overtaken this. Right, but he and wasn't so, attributing value to it. He was essentially saying, and the commentators were saying, mm -hmm. um, this is public information, it should be free, all the world's knowledge should be free, yet if it's not accessible and somebody isn't putting together the systems to organize it, um, people don't get access to it. Yeah. I mean, and Google would be an example of that. Larry, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the value you know, of the, the organizer of information. Copyright law traditionally tries to protect the creator, right. not the publisher, right. not the organizer. Right. Um, and you give a monopoly to the creator so that the creator has the right incentive to create. And I think part of the open access movement mm -hmm. builds on the fact that the creators of these copyrighted works are people who want this out there, right? Yeah. They want this work out there. There's mm -hmm. no, you know, the academic who writes a, a, a work that's locked up by JSTOR or locked up in any of these other places um, is not happy because of that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get more money because it's locked up in that yeah. way. So part of the conflict here, which motivated Aaron, was this recognition that the very people copyright law is trying to protect are not happy with the restrictions yeah. that apply to their work. And the people who are applying the restrictions are not doing it for creativity purposes. Mm -hmm. They're doing it for um, you know, other legitimate purposes, like you say. But the point is, that's not the thing that copyright law is directly supposed to be. And, and some is taxpayer funded. Right, so this, some of this is government funded mm -hmm. work. So if we're paying for this research, then, then the, the notion is that we should have access to it. Um. The, the, one of the most surprising things in the film is uh, MIT's uh, refusal to, to get involved. I mean, JSTOR quickly said that you know, they saw no reason uh, to prosecute. Um, and, and Larry, you were you know, two, three miles down the road. Yeah. Um, there, was there any way you could have applied influence on MIT? And what, do you, what have you learned since about what their motivation is? You must have colleagues there. Yeah, we, uh, and there was a very extensive campaign to get MIT to do the right thing. And there were great people inside of MIT who took the lead. Um, but you know, the thing that I learned, which uh, um, is an important point to recognize, I think, is the cultural difference between geeks or technologists yeah. and lawyers yeah. in the following sense. Um, I think if you take any lawyer and you say to him or her, here's somebody who's inside the criminal justice system, um, that lawyer's reaction would be, holy shit, <laughs> mm -hmm. this is a dangerous system. Mm -hmm. You know, it is not 
guaranteed to fire precisely or well. Mm -hmm. And if there's anything you can do to get that person out, you should do it, right? right? We who know the system well don't have a lot of faith in it. Mm -hmm. But the geeks, they live in more perfect worlds <laughs> with more perfect systems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that happened in MIT is they kind of believed that it would sort itself out in the right mm -hmm. way. They didn't feel like there was a reason to step in and yeah. to try to save. Because <laughs> yeah. they thought, you know, yeah. they've got lawyers and they've got judges and they've got, you know, checks and balances inside of it. Yeah. And as I saw that developing, I was just astonished. I was like, you know, you cannot trust us lawyers here. You can't trust the system. Yeah. You, you know, and, you're, and if you just stand by and don't do something, that's a really, really cruel act. Mm -hmm. and, and I think part of what's so outrageous about MIT is, you know, in the report from MIT, after, after Aaron died, MIT wrote a report. Right. Hal Abelson, somebody who knew Aaron very well, was the head of the report. And the report kind of comments about the fact that given MIT's policy, which was that access to MIT network resources is open, meaning literally anybody can walk off the street and sit in MIT's lobbies and open up their laptop and yeah. get access to the MIT network. Yeah. Given that fact, there was no, there was no crime here. Yeah. That and, what and Aaron from did, JSTOR. A, a, JSTOR. A, a free, a yeah. free. They had a free connection to JSTOR. Yeah. There was no crime here. And the whole criminal statute was triggered on unauthorized access. And this report kind of comments, you know, shouldn't, uh, um, you know, if, if our access is all authorized, then what in, in what sense has he committed a crime? And this question was raised by Joey Ito, who was the head of the Media Lab. He raised it to the yeah. president. He said, we have an open access environment. In what sense did Aaron commit a crime? And, and they said, well, you know, this is for the lawyers and the prosecutors to figure out. And, Aaron, and, and Joey said, no, shouldn't we tell them <laughs> that there's no crime here? Yeah. And, the, and their view was, no, yeah. it's not our job. Yeah. And, and when I heard that, yeah. it, you know, it just ripped me apart because for Christ's sake, yeah. you know something they don't care to know. Right. Yeah. And the fact that you wouldn't act on it yeah. in the face of such, you know, such a threat was just, yeah. just you know, impossible to, to kind of expect, accept. So, has there been any self-reflection on this either by MIT or by the Justice Department or U.S. Attorney's Office since his death? I mean, have, have you either of you heard anything from well, either, any of them? Have you heard? I, well, MIT is you know tearing itself apart. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, a lot of great people at MIT yeah. trying to get them to think about this in the right way. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, Ethan, Ethan Zuckerberg. Uh, uh, has been an amazing influence inside of MIT. Um, but I don't, you know, the Justice Department is not built for self-reflection. Yeah. Um, right, the, yeah. Right. There, there are a couple of notes and then, and then basically, you know, like the, 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 po the question posed to Holder at the beginning, yeah. you know, what was going on here, he basically said this was a fair use of prosecutorial yeah. discretion. Yeah. Uh, and, and not much has ever been, else has been said. We did screen the film in a very small, small setting at MIT a few months ago. Uh -huh. Um, with students, some students and faculty, and we plan to bring it back in the fall and fill their main hall, yeah. uh, and actually bring Aaron's dad and maybe, and maybe Larry, mm -hmm. and to, to sort of talk about it. There's a there's some soul searching going on there for sure, and we had a great discussion that night. Um, lots of interesting ideas were thrown around. I wasn't even meant for that, but clearly there's a dialogue going on. Yeah. So uh, hopefully the film kind of kind of encourages that. Yeah. Let me open it up to the floor because I'm sure you've got questions too. Um, do we have microphones coming around? I mean, we do. So um, just uh, we've got one in the middle here, one on the side here. So in the middle first and then then on the side. Hi, uh, my name is Mara Whiteman. I'm a journalist, well, recent graduate who's going to be a journalist. Uh, Dr. Lessig, uh, I was at your earlier lecture, and there was a point in the documentary where uh, sort of the only person on the side of the prosecution is explaining that uh, there are sort of the, the structures in our system where he should have gone through democracy to, uh, to achieve you know, the, the right action, basically. And, and given your, your talk earlier, it, it was such a painful moment for me to That's hear, you know, go through democracy, 
when we know now through, through the study at Princeton, democracy doesn't work like that. Can you comment at all? Well, it's even tighter than that because of course what I said in the lecture was Aaron's whole argument to me was that my effort to go through democracy to kind of get the laws changed around copyright and, um, and internet policy was doomed so long as we had this system of corruption in place. Um, and, uh, and so that's why I needed, and he did with me for a while too, take up this fight against that system. Um, uh, and it is, you know, it's a kind of convention among lawyer types to speak as if there is a democracy here to engage. Um, you know, it's kind of professional courtesy um, <laughs> to be respectful of the other branches and sort of say this is what you should expect to happen. But nobody seriously believes um, in the context of copyright legislation that the, that the Congress is going to do anything sensible about this. And, you know, even after Aaron's death and there was a big push, so Lofgren's a fantastic congresswoman from California um, who knew Aaron. Uh, uh, you know, she pushed for the, um, the modification of the CFAA, a statute called Aaron's Law. Um, and, um, and I was happy to help. But, you know, as I said to her, we know what's going to happen here, right? I mean, we know what's going to happen. And what did happen? You know, Oracle swept in and, and basically signaled to everybody on that committee that if it went anywhere, they were going to punish them. And so it didn't go anywhere. And it won't go anywhere. Uh, so tech company, a tech tech Oracle, companies, yeah. static from tech companies, yeah. really stalled that in committee, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, that's why Aaron wasn't about to go about trying to change it in that way. Um, and I don't, you know, the truth is, Aaron's motive for doing what he did um, is never really very clear. Uh, and when he got arrested, there was a period of time where I was acting as counsel for him. So he actually told me exactly what he was doing and I can't, I mean, the rules are I can't repeat that. Um, um, but his motive, you know, the thing about him is that he had 50 different projects he was working on at any one time. And what's kind of tragic about it is that, you know, this was important to him, but it wasn't the most important thing to him. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like the number one thing. And to, and to be caught by this, and to be pulled down by this. I think that's, in the end, what kind of made him crazy about it. It's, you know, yeah. there are a lot of other really important things to have been caught by and <laughs> pulled down by mm. that would have made it seem worth it. But this, this is, you know, so. Um, we have a question over here. Does the Swartz family have any legal recourse for prosecutorial misconduct? Are they pursuing that? What no. comes to mind is the Stephen Hatfield case a number of years ago. Dr. Hatfield in the anthrax matter later won a $6 million settlement. Why is there no recourse here for this family? So the general rule is that there's immunity, prosecutorial immunity. And you can sometimes get around that if there's really egregious you know, fraud or something like that. And uh, I just don't think in this case there's anything, there would be anything close to that. I mean, you know, I ha certainly have my view about the prosecution, but that's within the, you know, the realm of what's, um, you know, plausible for a prosecutor to be doing. Um, and they certainly continue to believe that what they did was legitimate. And, I, and even though, you know, what's striking is um, Nancy Gertner, who's a former federal judge who, who used to sit in that court and see that prosecutor and, and his boss um, uh, before her has been very critical of the prosecution. Um, but again, I don't think even she would think it rises to the level that there would be any legal recourse against um, the prosecutor or the government for what they did. Other questions? Okay, uh, we've got one down here. Um, I'm going to start off with a comment. So uh, we all know Helen Keller. Uh, she was blind and deaf, but we, do we know the other half of her life? Most scholars and students that go through US history do not know about her political life, that she was a socialist, and she was put down by President Wilson. But we also know that Andrew Jackson is on the $20, $20 bill, to, but to, most students do not know that he caused the 12 tears. Mm -hmm. These are all made by a cooperation of textbook uh, writers and publishers. 
and they are always in favor of the government. So in the future, when we write our next textbook, do you think that we will remember uh, Aaron, uh, Aaron uh, Mr. Swartz mm -hmm. as a hero, or are we gonna take away half his, half his life as we did with Helen Keller? That was a great question. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I hope this film helps us <laughs> uh, sort of uh, at least the, what's the what's the rough draft first rough draft of of history i mean uh, hope, hopefully you know if we keep that a lot you know a lot of that memory uh, hopefully and and the, and not only that but the sort of the things that he was involved with, both the things that he did and the things that happened to him um, yeah hopefully hopefully stories like this hopefully it's can too help. weak a word here yeah <laughs> no because there's something very important about the way Brian did the film um, in that he licensed it freely. It's a Creative Commons licensed film. And so in the future of textbooks, the one great opportunity of the future of textbooks is open source textbooks. Um, and those types of books will be able to draw more easily on work like Brian's. So in answer to your question, I think it's very unlikely that you'll be able to tell a story in the format that the future of textbooks will have that won't have something like Brian's work sitting next to whatever official story wants to be told about it. So the likelihood that he will be understood in the wrong way is much less. And that's part of the thing Aaron was fighting for. Yeah, it was it, the it idea is. that information would be so accessible that you couldn't retell the story of Helen Keller. I mean, and picture the researcher that has that has given up their copyright to JSTOR, right, and and surrendered this copyright. They're not getting uh, cited, right? They're not getting their work out. You know, a researcher wants that. They want their work out there. That anybody who's doing this kind of academic research wants the world to know about it and build on it. Uh, and so those kinds of paywalls and those kinds of situations that Aaron was fighting for restrict that. You know. They, they, they restrict that flow of information. It's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Question. Um, okay, uh, we've got one in the middle over here and then one in the middle of it, well, three in the middle back there. Cool. Um, hi, a question for Lawrence Lessig. Um, are you in any way heartened at the hacker community and other activists and democracy workers? Are you in any sense um, hopeful about their renewed activism? Can you give any examples? Do you feel it's fired our community to take more action? Yeah, um, so you, your accent, are you, are you, do you live in America or? Okay, okay. So, um, so what always struck me about, active, about geeks is that non-American geeks were always very politically active and American geeks were always politically passive. Um, and it kind of made sense, because you'd say American government's a waste of your time, especially if you've got real talent. Um, so, uh, you know, why waste, you know, why do, you know, you might as well code rather than try to get a congressperson to do something. Um, but I do, uh, I am much more optimistic um, now. Uh, you know, organizations like EFF have done, and Demand Progress, have done an amazing job at bringing the tech community into political fights. And increasingly, they get it. They get the importance of being engaged in these kind of political fights. Um, the Mayday Pack, uh, Steve Wozniak has come out and done a video for the Mayday Pack. And, and you listen to the story he tells, and it's all about how if we don't learn how to solve this problem, they're going to kill us. They're going to crush us. They're going to destroy us. Um, um, and, uh, and so this, you know, Aaron obviously helped in that. Um, because he demonstrated in his own life, you know, long before the prosecution of Aaron Swartz, he demonstrated his own life, in his own life that technical skills not applied to social good are wasted. You know, and he, it wasn't enough for him to be a great coder. Uh, what he wanted to be was somebody who was using those technical skills for good, for good. And um, I think he inspired a lot of people in that. Uh, and continues to inspire a lot of people. And, and my own view is the way we win is when we rally the technical community in the right way to force a change in the way our government works. Um, yeah. and, and we need, we need 
we need them, right? I mean, you know, the, the internet is not some far off distant realm of geeks and hackers. It's where we live. It's where we do everything important right now. It's, it's as close as it gets to the public square. And so, um, you know, this moving into this new world, I think, you know, we all have a voice in this world, and, and it's all, you know, I just think it's something. It's something that we need. That we need the technical skills, but we don't. We, we don't want to. They're not sorcerers. They're they're part of us. I mean, the internet is this machine basically made of code and laws. But we we get to decide what it is right now. I think we had a couple nearby you here. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, my my question. My name is Phyllis Haynes. I'm a former ABC News correspondent. So my question is for the moderator as well as for the professor. Um, what can the people in this room who are not geeks do? What could you give them as a as specific instruction for those who are not necessarily coders who could go out and do something? Obviously, they can give to the May Day project, which is clearly a request. But what else could the average user do on a day-to-day -day basis? And what can journalists do? I mean, I think sometimes the journalists just reflect the government line. Now, unlike the doc brave documentary person here. So I'd like your input as well. Thank you. Well, you know, I, I think there's room for advocacy journalism and also room for journalism that, um, that isn't so advocacy focused. But I think in this case, uh, one of the things that I was really struck by was how, how little attention what Aaron was doing had gotten in what people typically call the mainstream media. And I had heard very little about it uh, prior to seeing this film, frankly, in, in preparing for this. And so my self-reflection on it was there's some very important things going on in parts uh, of the country and parts of the society um, that uh, don't get that amount of uh, attention. Um, hiring, frankly, uh, smart, young, uh, and uh, tech-savvy journalists uh, is really important because there is, in fact, a significant gap between digital natives and, and people who didn't grow up with it. And my suspicion is having some tech reporters um, who were, uh, you know, more plugged into that generation of activity uh, would have been really helpful. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I, you know, I think the one big takeaway that's not tied to tech is the point Brian was making earlier about just the nature of our criminal justice system, um, uh, which, is, which is terrible. It's a terrible criminal justice system. Um, and it really needs political pressure to push it in a direction of more humane, proportional punishment for the crimes it's trying to attack. And in this context in particular, you know, the idea that a US attorney could stand up before reporters, um, as this US attorney did, and brag about the fact that she was going to try to send this boy away to jail for 35 years for what he did um, is astonishing. It's an embarrassment uh, in, in, in the kind of ignorance it betrays about uh, the, the relation between what Aaron did, even if what Aaron did was a crime, and the consequences or punishment that should come from it. And the only way we check that is if we develop something Americans are not great at, a recognition of the need for limits and balance in our criminal penalties. Um, you know, we are the most extreme around the world in criminal penalties. Um, and when you think about what it means to go to jail, you know, it, 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 is an aston it is an astonishing cruelty to, that we do to our citizens. Uh, you know, um, and then we deny them citizenship when they get out. They're not allowed to vote, uh, for example. Um, so we need to build this recognition. And I think one thing that many people who look at the Aaron Swartz story hope is that this helps a community who isn't typically focused on the problems of criminal justice to focus on the problems of criminal justice. You know, obviously, activists in the African-American community um, in ghetto, uh, you know, the ghettos of America, which are obviously constructed by our criminal justice system through the, through the extreme penalties around the drug wars and things like that. They've been aware and pushing this issue for a long time. But to bring geeks into it and to bring the tech community into it is, a, is an advance. And, and I certainly believe that you've got to bring more journalists into the recognition of the craziness of this. Um. One word on journalism. We need to support independent, really independent journalism. I mean, it, it is a problem in this country. We have, um, if you were to, 
rewind the clock, you know, go back 40 years, you probably had maybe 50 companies with uh, media companies that might have had like an overall uh, sort of nationwide reach. Now you've got about five. And, uh, you know, not to be cynical, but, you know, you, a lot of what you can say about the products of those five is it's access journalism. It's, it's softball stories for access to power and celebrity. So um, anything that, that breaks out of that, that challenges that system, that goes deeper into stories, uh, is, is absolutely worth our, our support. But there is something about the way this developed that I was very, um, I was amazed by. Um, you know, I, I, was in, I was away when I got, I was in Mexico when I got the call that Aaron had died. Um, and so I got a call around midnight and I couldn't sleep and I finally fell asleep at around three and I had to get up at five to go catch a plane. And um, when I woke up, I thought, what if nobody notices? Like, what if he just dies? Um, and already by five, the internet was exploding. Um, and what was striking about that was that this is a kid who basically had no mainstream media coverage at all. I mean, he had had, you know, been on a couple television shows, but, you know, it wasn't like anybody in mainstream media knew who Aaron Swartz was. And then the world, the whole internet exploded. People were outraged and upset. And, and I experienced watching these mainstream media people saying, whoa, <laughs> how did we not know about this? How was there this whole reality out there that we had no clue about? And what is this ecosystem of knowledge or information that goes on that we have no clue on. And I was really, it kind of reminded me, you know, of, um, you know, there's a scene in, um, in Gandhi, the film Gandhi, where, um, uh, you know, of course, Gandhi can't use the press to talk about what he's doing because he's banned from the press to talk about what he's doing. Um, and when he organizes his march to, um, to the ocean, the salt march, um, they've got to figure out how to organize it. And they have this kind of whisper campaign, kind of like retweeting, right? It's like, it's like one person to one person, like, yeah whispering of the organization of the march. And they organized this incredible march. And you know the, the uh, colonialists and the Indian government, they're like, how did they do that? Like, where is that? Where was that communication happening? And I kind of think we, we've, we've moved to that place where there's two different information ecologies. Um, and one, the internet information ecology is rich and vibrant yeah. and not really fed from the top, yeah. um, even though sometimes it sort of bubbles up yeah. to the top. I mean, I'd argue that the, 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 the worlds are, are merging because social media is becoming media. a big part of mainstream media and it's, they're feeding each other, but that's for the future. By the way, there's a new, new uh, journalism organization forming called the Marshall Project, and Bill Keller, the former editor of the New York Times, is the editor-in-chief of it, and it focuses specifically on looking at the criminal justice system, and it, it's probably going to do some very interesting things. I think we have time uh, for one more question, and uh, we've got a lot of questions. Okay, I'm going to say this time for two more questions. So one over here, and then uh, one in the back. Um, so let's, let's wait for the microphone. It's coming. I'm wondering where Edward Snowden fits into all this, and if what Aaron would have thought of that situation, and what you folks think of that situation. Part of the reason why I like hacker stories is they, they seem to have very low tolerance for nonsense, right? They, they seem to be in this kind of relentless pursuit of the truth. Um, you know, they break, they route around these kind of walls of deception. And, um, you know, we need the truth, right? We just, we, whether that's the truth of the universe in the kind of form of what, you know, research and knowledge, the kind of things that Aaron was studying, or uh, truth of our actual relationship with our government, you know, big piece of that puzzle we just didn't know until Aaron, until uh, Snowden came forward. Um, you know, we, we face big intractable problems as a species, and the only way we solve them is to, to know what's real and uh, to come armed with the truth. Uh, it's the only way we, we solve things like climate change, it's the only way we like, make lives better for people, and it's the only way we figure out ultimately how to govern ourselves. I think that's how they relate. Yeah, and um, Aaron would have loved Snowden, and, but not just because of what Snowden's revealed, but there's a certain kind of humility in the way he's done it, right? He's gonna put himself out there, he's willing to take you know, he's basically signed himself to Russia, maybe for how long? Um, but he's also been, you know, kind of an integrity to the way in which he's constantly backed this up. And, there's, and there isn't the kind of ego that we've seen in other similar contexts, you know? So um, that would have been really appealing to him because the one thing that really turned him off was, you know, puffery and ego and on, on that sort of, that, that level. I mean, so Snowden would have been an ally. Okay, last question. 
I'd like to know whether you think it contributes to this whole problem, the fact that we tend to marginalize people like Aaron as a geek, as a hacker, instead of recognizing them as being a computer and internet expert or genius, instead of calling them geeks or hackers but or nerds, but label them, it, but unfairly labeling them marginalizes their importance in our society. Yeah, or it just shows how uh, this disconnect that we have. That's one of the reasons why I use the, the um, John Stewart clip, right? That sort of mashup, like we gotta have more nerds in here. We gotta like, you know, bring some nerds in to explain this to us. And, and you know, John, you got that great line, like I think the word you're looking for is experts. Um, that's what it is. It's no longer okay to kind of legislate these things without understanding. Uh, what what it is that you're legislating? So, um, but the I was on a panel with Chris Segoyan, um recently, and he says that people treat hackers and geeks like sorcerers, uh, and you know what did they do to sorcerers? They they tracked them down and they burned them at the stake. They were they were magical. They were kind of uh, scary and and uh, made people nervous. Um, again, that isn't the world we're in. We all live online. This is a big part of all of our lives. And we just ne we need to bridge this gap. You know, I think in his act in his life, there was a relatively short period of time when he was punished for this. So that's to say, for most of his life, this was a source of um, great strength. Um, when he was a Stanford undergraduate, um, it was kind of a miserable time for him because Stanford's you know got lots of technical power, of course, but you know freshmen are not the most generous and um, kind to each other. So you know, being a little bit different was hard in that context. But every other context, the qualities that you're talking about were, were sources of power and, and respect. Um, and you know, I saw that when he came to Harvard and he was back and forth between Harvard and, and MIT, uh, you know, he was treated in, and I, when I felt, what felt like me to be a completely appropriately respectful and, and supportive way, um, you know, it becomes, cool to be exactly that, have that exact mix of, 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 of qualities. Um, uh, and, and that's a good thing because I, you know, um, historically there have been people with technical knowledge um, who have been called upon to do great things for society. Um, I, you know, there was a time when that's what we called lawyers. Um, I, I get most people don't see that about lawyers anymore, but, um, but that's how lawyers thought of themselves. Like we have technical power and we will use our power for good. And what I love about the way Aaron has infected the technical community is more of them begin to think of themselves in those terms. We have magical powers. You know, you muggles out there don't quite understand what we can do and we will use our magical powers for good. That's why we're here. Um, uh, and I think that's, that's progress. That's, that's something to be hopeful about. That seems like a wonderful place to end. Uh, thank you, Larry, for your insights. And thank you, Brian, for this extraordinary film. Thank you.